the first uh, uh, eight verses of Romans chapter 8. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now that was the same Scripture again that I read in Sunday school there, but we're going to expand on that a little bit this morning and give you a few examples of this throughout the Bible. And If you want to, you turn your Bible back to 2 Samuel verse 24. I'm sorry, uh, chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And I'm going to do a little bit of reading here about King David. And uh, some of you know this Scripture very well, but uh, God had uh, God was angry with Israel there. And the Bible says that here in 2 Samuel 24 that, that He moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Now we know that goes strictly against the command of God. He gave the command several times not to number the nation Israel. Don't go out and count heads now and depend on the odds to, to make you feel better in battle. He said, I'll put a thousand to flight with one, you know, or ten thousand with ten. Uh, don't depend on the odds. Well, he's moved David now because of his anger to number Israel. And David has sent Joab out to do that. Joab is David's general. And he sends him out to number Israel. And Joab, he, he prophet, he, he can, I don't know what to, <laughs> he tells the king, this is a bad idea. You know, I, I can't think of the right word, but he says to him, you know, God has commanded us not to do this. But it says here that the king's word prevailed over Joab. You know, Joab was under subjection to the king and he had to go out and do the command of the king. So he goes out and he numbers Israel. And the Bible says that there were, uh, 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. So about 1.3 million men there in the nation Israel overall. This is in 2 Samuel 24. I'm going to start the 10th verse. And it said, this is right after Joab has delivered the numbers to David. And it says that, And David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have, in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. Now, God is about to offer to David three different punishments and let David choose. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I always hated when my parents done that to me. Uh, you know, what do you want? Grounding or a whooping? I'd pick one and they'd do the other one, you know. Uh, but here, verse 13 says, So Gad came to David and told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land, or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee, or that there be three days pestilence in the land? Now, he offered him seven years famine, uh, three months of fleeing before his enemies, or three days pestilence. He says, Now advise, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning, even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. A great number dies now because of the action of David. 
And he says, And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thy hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arunah the Jebusite. And David spake unto the people when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Uh, let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. I'm going to stop right there a minute uh, this morning. I'm going to read the rest of it here in a minute, but I want to stop right there and I want to point out the, the place that this angel of God stops. Now, I also want to point out that David can see this angel. It says uh, there that that when he saw him down here uh, by this threshing floor, and that Gad the seer came to David and told him, go down by the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite and build there an altar. Now David can see this angel, and I'm guessing probably that uh, anybody there can see him. You know, he's sitting there and he's waiting on the command of God. Do I go on? Do I destroy more? Do I wait? Do I stop? Do I go back? You know, that angel is just sitting there waiting on command. And, and David comes comes down to that place by the command of God through Gad, his, his prophet there. And he, he comes down there with the intention of building an altar uh, by this threshing floor of Arunah. Now I want to talk a little bit this morning about that threshing floor. Uh, I actually want to talk about a couple of them this morning. Uh, a threshing floor, for those of you, probably all of you know, but maybe somebody don't. Uh, it was a place that they would take the wheat and they would they would throw the, the seed of the wheat out there on that threshing floor and they they would take these uh, fans and they would beat uh, the, the seed of that wheat. Some of you have seen it. We call it a husk. The Bible calls it chaff. But that little uh, outer shell on that wheat, uh, while they would beat that, it would separate that seed uh, from that outer shell, that husk, you know. Uh, and then they would take that seed and they would throw it up into the air while the wind was blowing. And the wind would carry away that, that little husk, that chaff, you know, while it was because it was so much lighter than the seed that actual uh, seed was, the wind would carry it away. And uh, so we see a, a separation here uh, it, from, from one thing from another. You know, two things, two things brought up in one body, but now they must be separated. So God uh, sends this angel and he, he sends him down. Now, you don't just stop him down here by the, the piggly wiggly or something like that. He sends him on down by that threshing floor, that place uh, of separation, that place where the outer uh, must die and be taken taken away and be and the inner must rule you know that that seed must take place there it's what remains when god is done is separating but he tells him that in david it's verse 19 he says, and, and David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arunah looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arunah went out and bowed himself before the king uh, on his face upon the ground. And Arunah said, uh, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, uh, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, uh, that the plague might be stayed from the people. And, and verse 22 says that in Arunah, Arunah said unto David, Let my lord the king uh, take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. Uh, all these things did Aruna as a king give unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. Well, uh, Aruna is down here. It's his property you know, that he's on. And now they're looking over off to the side somewhere. And here sits an angel. Angel of God, not only you know, here sits the one that's been doing the destroying seventy thousand men now dead, and now we have this exchange that goes goes on between Aruna and David, and it looks like a calm thing as we read it, but you could probably bet this morning that it wasn't such a calm interchange, you know, as they look over and here sits this angel, and I know that when we think about angels today, that we get this picture of a little fat baby flying around with a 
a bow and arrow. Folks, that's not the biblical uh, picture of an angel. Uh, it was one that was sent you know, under the direction of God uh, to bless, if that was the direction of God, but to destroy, if that was the direction of God. He was there only to do the command of God. And he's now uh, killed 70,000 men of Israel. Uh, we see as you read about these angels, the power that God had given them. Uh, when you read about Hezekiah, when Sennacherib sent his army down there, and they're outside the wall, and they're telling him, you know, they're hollering across that wall, and they're telling uh, the people there in Jerusalem, said, don't, uh, don't let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in your God. Uh, look at all these other nations that we've destroyed. Uh, they ain't, their gods ain't been able to save them. Your God ain't going to be able to save you either. Don't let Hezekiah persuade you. Well, Hezekiah commanded the people there and he said, I answer them not a word. Don't even acknowledge that they're up there on that wall. And Hezekiah, he took that letter from Sennacherib. All of you know this, but he took it up into the temple and he spread it out. The Bible says, before the Lord there that day and he prayed and God saw what was going on. He said, you don't have to worry. He said, there won't be one arrow come across that wall. You see, well, hard thing to believe, no doubt, but Hezekiah took it by faith. That night, the angel of God went through the camp of the Assyrians without waking one person up. He killed 185,000 men that night. You know, just a walk through that camp and they died. Well, we see this pair of God that, that is given to these angels. And now this angel is sitting down here by this threshing floor and David comes down and Aruna walks out and he says, you know, what's going on, king? What are you doing down here? He said, I come to buy this threshing floor. I need to offer sacrifice to God. Well, it looks like a calm conversation going on, but you can, you know, you can probably say that Aruna's looking over here at this angel and he's looking over at the destruction that's taking place. And I'd say that there's a great amount of fear that's on them men as they sit there talking about this. And he's telling David, he says, listen, here's the oxen. Here's the wood. Uh, you take anything you want. You know, you, you just go ahead. And he's dying to give it away. You know, he's wanting to give this to David that the hand of God could be stayed there that day. But David tells him, he says that in verse uh, uh, 24, and the king said unto Runa, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. And so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver, and David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. Now David tells Aruna here, you know, I look, brother, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate you coming out here and offering to give me this, but I've got to offer a sacrifice to God. You see, this is, this can't be something that didn't cost me anything. Uh, that's what we all want to give God anymore, seems like. Well, Lord, uh, I, I'll go down there to the church house uh, on Wednesday night as long as it don't interfere with Mazumba uh, down there at the gym or something like that, you know. I got, Lord, I, I would go, but my favorite television show uh, comes on on Sunday evenings. Uh, Lord, I'd love to be with You. I'd love to pray, but I've got this other thing going on right now. I can't give You nothing, you know. Uh, Lord, I'd love to, to fast. I, Oh, I'd like to be able to cast out demons, but I know they only come forth by prayer and fasting, and I'd have to give up a meal now and then to be able to do those things. I can't do that because it's going to cost me. Well, I'm going to tell you, when God brought them down to that place of separation, you know, He talks about it in Matthew there. John spoke in Matthew 3.11. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in His hand. Now listen, He's at the threshing floor now and He said that whose fan is in His hand and He will thoroughly purge His floor and gather His wheat into the garner, but He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, God's brought them down to this threshing floor, this place of separation, and He's punishing Israel for the sins of David. 
David and, and David comes down there and David, we know the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. He made a lot of mistakes, uh, but he was a man that wanted to please God and, and when he could get uh, in a place where he was spiritually minded, he would do the thing that pleased God. Well, uh, nothing like 70,000 of your brothers laying dead because of your sin to bring you into a place uh, where you're spiritually minded. David now, he, he says, I now see uh, where, where I'm at, what I've done, what I need to do, and I know that it's going to have to cost me something uh, if God's going to accept what I give Him. Amen? Amen. We, we've got to be willing to give up something for God. You read back through the Old Testament, you look at the sacrifices that was brought. He said every time, he'd say, I want the lamb without spot or blemish. I want the firstborn. I want the, the best that you've got. You don't bring me something that's hard or lame. You know, you read over in Malachi there when he said that, that you've offended me. And they said, we're in. And we offended thee in that you offer the halt and the lame for sacrifice. You know, they brought him something that they just didn't care about. You know, well, God wants us to love Love him this morning uh, more than we love anything else in this world. You know, uh, he, he offers us this, this salvation today, and he never forced that on anybody in this world. And a lot of people say, "Well, wh- if, if God loves us so much, uh, why does he just let people die lost?" Well, uh, God's paid a great price to, to make a way that we don't have to die lost. We can we can be saved. We can be born uh, into that family. That we can we can be born of that spirit of adoption. Uh, we can cry out, have a Father. We can go uh, up to that place that He's prepared for us, but uh, we might have to give up a little something. You know, I, I promise you this morning, uh, it's going to be worth more than you can ever give Him you know, to be able to stand before Him one of these days and hear Him say, Enter in, my good and faithful servant. Uh, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll, I'll make you ruler over many. Uh, there'll never be a word that's spoken in this world that'll mean as much to us as to hear God welcome us into His kingdom. But it might cost you something. You might have to separate yourself uh, from something. You know, folks, I mean, I was reading there the other night, I can't remember where it was at exactly, but it said there that let, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, it seemed like that we've got into just such a, a just a weak, a mushy gospel anymore. You know, everybody just, oh, they, they and I, I, folks, I know that God loves us. I love that song, that misty song about how that God loves us. I sat there on that pew of tears running right down my face because I know that He does love me. Just like the song says, I know that He loves me. I know that I'm, I may not be worth anything in this world, but folks, I'm worth a great price to God. I know that because He's already paid that great price. He's already sent His Son to die on a cross for me. If I was worthless in His sight, He'd have never, never paid that price for me. But He did. He's already already paid that price. I know that God loves us today, but I also know that He's a just God. You know, He says that certain things, you you can't be... I'm not preaching one way or the other this morning, but I'm saying this, that certain things you can't do and be born again. You know, I had a man try to trip me up in the jail one time there, told a big story, ended it with a question, pointed at me, and I wanted to know what the answer was. I said, I can't tell you what the answer you're looking for is. Is, uh, but I can tell you that a born again, a child of God wouldn't be doing what you're asking me about. Amen. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Anybody out there? I'm glad I'm not blind. I think I was in the church house by myself this morning. <laughs> David understood this, and you know, I like where God brought him to that threshing floor, that place of separation. You read, and you guys don't have to turn here if you don't want to, but you you go to Judges chapter 6, and it starts to talk about Gideon. It says that in verse 7, it says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, 
that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Now, here we see disobedience creeping in. And verse 11 says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in uh, Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abizrite, I can't pronounce that, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Now, where does he come to? He comes right down next to the threshing floor again. You know, God sends another angel to talk to another man at another threshing floor. But now this is a different kind of a place. It says that Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Most of the time, they'd build these threshing floors up on top of the hills where the wind would blow the chaff away as they throw it up. But now, Gideon's got him one built down here by the wine press. Well, well, what's the difference? He's at the bottom of the hill, you see. Uh, he, he built it down there next to the wine press. They hauled those grapes. Now, they were a heavy thing. They, they weren't easy to move for them. Uh, so they'd build their wine press at the bottom of the hill so they didn't have to uh, lug those grapes up the hill. Well, Gideon's built him a, a threshing floor down there uh, with one purpose, and that is to hide uh, from the Midianites. He's hiding from the ones that are oppressing Israel. And this angel... Verse 12 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, uh, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, if there was ever irony in the Bible, this is it. you got a man that's hiding. He's down here at the bottom of the hill. He's in the wrong place. He's threshing wheat down here by the wine press, hiding from the enemy. And the angel shows up and he said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I can imagine uh, old Gideon must have looked around trying to figure out uh, who in the world he was talking to. You know, I don't see no uh, mighty men of valor around here. It's just me uh, down here uh, threshing this this week, but this angel speaks to him and he calls him a mighty man of valor. And it says, And Gibeon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Uh, and where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him. Now here, listen to this and said, Go in this thy might, that thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midians as one man. Now God, He's, he's come down now, He's sent that angel down, and He's found a man that's over here hiding from the enemy and he calls him a mighty man of valor and he tells this man he said I'm going to send you to save Israel from the Midianites and Gideon says look God, I'm from a poor family, and I'm the least in the poor family. I'm the poorest of the poor. I'm the least of the least. And God says, you'll smite the Midianites as one man. You go on, and you study about Gideon, you'll find him later on. Now the Bible says, I can't remember the numbers, but the Bible says that they were getting ready to go into battle. And God said, when they come down to the place where they was drinking that, He said there, he said, all the ones that, that laps water like a dog, you take them into battle. But all the ones that cups water in his hand, I believe it was, and drinks it from his hand, you send them back. You don't take them into battle. Well, Gideon watched them as they come down, as they begin to drink. And I, I forget how many thousand of men of Israel there that he had getting ready to go into battle. And he watched them as they come down to the river, or whatever it was, to drink. And 300 and something men lapped water like a dog. 
dog. And I can kind of imagine what must have been going through Gideon's mind. He probably thought, well, uh, these 300 I'm going to send back. You know, I'm not going to use these 300. I'm only going to take the 9,700 or whatever it was uh, that was left over. But when it was said and done, uh, God said, you take these men in the battle that have lapped water like a dog. Gideon, I'm going to send you a man that I found hiding by a wine press uh, down there one day and 300 men in there to defeat the nation of the Midianites. Well, uh, I promise you this morning that Gideon had to make a change uh, from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded uh, in a hurry. It had to take place pretty quick. Uh, David had to do that too when he found out the punishment that God would send uh, for numbering the nation of Israel. He had to make a change from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. Uh, it didn't matter anymore what the circumstances, what the, the, the odds were. He had to be in a place where he could say, now I have to trust God because it can't work any other way. Amen? He had to come to that. Folks, we've got to come to that. We have to. You read about Samuel. I was reading it last night. Get over in Second Samuel. I ain't gonna read it to you. I know I've already read you to death about it this morning, but you get over Second Samuel, or I'm sorry, First Samuel, uh, chapter two, and start reading about the call of Samuel there, and he's a little old boy. His mama has brought him up there when he's born. She's prayed to God, and she says, "God, if you'll give me a man child, I'll give him back to you." You know, that's her promise to God. Uh, she was barren; she couldn't have any children. Uh, not too much time went by till uh, uh, she got up sick one morning. You know, I guess what happened. I don't know. And anyway, she wound up pregnant, and she had that little old boy, Samuel, and she brought him up uh, just as soon as he was big enough to wean. She brought him up. And she gave him to Eli, the priest down there. And he was to be raised uh, a Nazarite. And he was to be a priest. He was to be raised up in that temple underneath that priest. She had to leave him there that day. And you read, uh, she was very much a mother. The Bible says that uh, she come back to see him every year. She brought him a, she'd make him a little cold or something like that. You know, every time that she come back, she wanted to take care of him. Uh, but she knew that he belonged to God. Well, uh, one night there, they laid down and I uh, went to sleep and, and God began to speak to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. And he'd get up and go in there where Eli was at. Uh, here I am. What do you want? You know, Eli say, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Well, about three times that happened. And finally, Eli, cold and indifferent. Now, this is the priest of God. Uh, Eli, cold and indifferent, finally uh, remembered what it was like for God to speak to him. And he told Samuel there, he said, this, and that's God uh, talking to you. He said, the next time that He speaks to you, you just say, here am I, Lord. Well, uh, Samuel went back to bed in there. Uh, laid down a few minutes, I guess, and the Bible says that God spoke to him again, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Hear my Lord. And God began to speak to that little old boy about all that he was going to do to the house of Eli, that priest there, uh, because of the sins that he had allowed uh, to come into the house of God. Uh, Eli had two sons there, I don't remember their names, uh, but they would take the sacrifices of God uh, for themselves. And according to the law of God, God, the tradition, uh, they were supposed to bring in the sacrifice and uh, put it into the seething pot, and the priest was supposed to put in a flesh hook, the Bible says. I think it said a flesh hook with three hooks on it, uh, and whatever come up out of there, whatever it hooked into, uh, was theirs to keep. But these boys, uh, they got to where the people would bring in the sacrifice, and they'd start taking what they wanted before they ever offered to God. They'd say, uh, cut out that tenderloin for me. You know, I'm going to take that. I'd like to have that ham right there. Or whatever it was. They started to cut those things out before they offered to God. Uh, they allowed the prostitutes in the door of the temple. Uh, and these men, these two priests of God, began to lay uh, with the prostitutes that hung around the door uh, of that temple there. And so God began to speak to Samuel. And He began to tell him, He said, both these these boys are going to die in the same day. It's going to be a sign of what I'm going to bring forth. Well, a little bit of time goes by, and if I remember all the Scripture right, these boys were off somewhere in Babylon.
battle. The next thing you know, they're both dead. Now they send word to Eli. And the Bible says that Eli, if I, it's been a long time since I read this part now, but I believe that it says that he was sitting on a chair up on the wall. It said that he was old and he was fat. The Bible says that when they brought the news to him that his sons were killed, that he fell off there and broke his neck and died. You see, in one minute, God separated the spiritual from the carnal. He's going to do that again one of these days. He will do that again one of these days. I already read it to you in Matthew there where he says that whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He's going to separate. You read about it. You know, here it is the wheat and the chaff. You read about Revelation, it's the sheep and the goats, the carnal from the spiritual, the flesh from the spirit. You can read about it a lot of different places. It might be worded a little different here and there, but what it boils down to this morning is just what we read in Romans chapter 8 now that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You see, we've got to get to a place where this mind is in subjection to the spirit that God has put in us, folks. We can't allow allow the mind to keep ruling over the Spirit of God. We are talking in Sunday school this morning. I told them, uh, you know, that tomorrow morning, Lord willing, nothing changes. Now, I'll get up and go into a workplace, go into that office. Uh, it won't be very long, I can tell you, uh, before somebody walks in there and says, we've got a problem, uh, we need you to come out here and look at it. Well, uh, I've got a choice to make. I can stomp my feet, throw something on the way out the door and say, well, I worked on that all, all week last week and got nothing done, or I can go out the door and I can say, God, I understand today that whatever I'm going through, uh, you're putting me through to conform me now to the image of that Christ that, that, Christ that you sent. Uh, Lord, I'm going out here to deal with this problem, and I pray uh, that you go with me and allow me to be a light in the midst of this. Amen? Amen. Philippians tells us that, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. It's easy to be a Christian here. No problem. You walk in here, everybody shakes your hand, everybody tells you, I love you, it's good to see you. You got any problems? Can I help you? Sorry you've been sick. Sorry you had to... You know, it's easy inside these walls to be what God tells us to be. But what about outside the walls? You know, what about when there's a problem out there? How do we, how do we deal with it out there? Do we deal with it just like the world deals with it? Or are we that light in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation? You see, uh, Samuel was raised up in the house of a, of a cold and indifferent priest. He was, he was raised up in a temple uh, where the, the two sons of Eli, the two priests there, now Eli is the high priest, their priest under him, uh, and Samuel serves the office of priest, you see. He's just a gopher, you know, but there he is. Uh, the Bible says, if I remember right, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, that he was just a young boy, but that he was clothed in a linen uh, ephod, and it points to a separation. Uh, he was different than the, than the others, uh, and it wasn't because of how he was raised or what he was taught. Uh, he was raised in the midst of a crooked and perverse priest and a crooked and perverse religion and temple and all that, but because that Samuel truly had the call of God on his life and because that he was spiritually minded and not carnally minded, he was able to lay there one night as a little boy and God spoke to him and said, this is what I'm going to do. And you're going to be a part of it. Samuel had just about the most spotless record of any of the prophets. You say, well, so God spoke to a little boy. Big deal. Samuel lived the rest of his life like that. He's the same Samuel that anointed Saul as king under the command of God. He's the same Samuel that stood in Jesse's house and said, no, it's not any of these sons. Do you have another? And he anointed King David king over Israel. 
He's the, he's the same Samuel that the Spirit of God was so powerful on that when Saul come down there to him, uh, even with that evil spirit already pronounced upon him, the Bible says that when Saul came into the presence of Samuel, that he, he pulled his clothes off. I don't mean he was naked now, but that he, he pulled his robe off, I guess. And he prophesied before Samuel because of the power of the presence of God uh, with this man. You, you can read about that. Uh, several of them there you know, have prophesied in the presence of Samuel because of the power of the presence of God with him. So he's a prophet. Big deal, right? Lots of prophets. He's not just a prophet. He's a prophet that started out with, with all the odds stacked against him. He's a prophet that started out uh, watching false religion. <laughs> he, he, you know, how many of you have heard somebody say, well, there's hypocrites down there in that church house. I don't want to go. If if they make it, I ain't got nothing to worry about. Probably all of us heard somebody say that. Uh, Samuel had as much or more right than anybody in this world to say that. He knew for a fact that there was hypocrites in that house. He knew for a fact that they even in even in what was supposed to be the service of God, that they profaned that temple. But he turned out to be one of the greatest prophets that we read about in the Bible. Why? Because he's he's spiritually minded. He let, he allowed the Spirit of God to overcome the carnal mind. That's where our battle is going to be. That's where we're going to fight. This this soul, once God saves it, wants to be in fellowship with God. That's its desire. It wants to be that. But we find ourselves in a, in a warfare. And that warfare is going to take place in the mind. It's going to be there that you're going to have to overcome. And I'm going to warn you about something today. God don't save your mind. God don't save your flesh. God saves your soul. And then it's up to you to to make the the right decisions, to make the right commitments, to, to stand to those commitments and say, I understand that God's not saved this mind of mine, but I'm going to I'm going to let my spirit rule over it. I'm not I'm not going to let my mind rule what I do. I'm not going to lean to my own understanding. It's not going to be by my understanding that I accomplish anything for God. If it had been, I'd have quit a long time ago. I, I would have because I'd have felt like I never was going to accomplish anything. Job said in don't turn here. Job ten twelve. He says, "This is why Job was, of course, suffering so great. He's, he's sitting there, great boils on him. His family's died. You know, he's Job is suffering like probably not very many people in this world ever suffered. But he he, he professes to God in, in chapter ten verse twelve. He says, Thou hast granted me life and favor. It sure don't look like it." Job, you sure don't look like God has granted you favor sitting there in that sackcloth with those old ashes poured over the top of your head. You're black from head to toe. you got great big boils just running and bleeding. You don't look like God's granted you any favor. But He says, Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. It wasn't His situation it was the visitation of God that had preserved his spirit you read about King Josiah I ain't going to read this to you because I know he about killed you already probably but Second Kings 23 it talks about uh, Josiah there and all that he'd done he tore down the groves he tore down the idols he removed even his own mother as being queen because she didn't have a heart for God. He come down and he found the, the, the altars where they'd burnt incense to these false gods. 
and he took he, he turned. The Bible says that when he uh, this is in Second uh, Kings twenty three verse sixteen, and as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchres that were in the mount, and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchres and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed. Who proclaimed these words? He turned around as he's destroying all the things that are contrary to the will of God. He turns around. And now he sees the sepulchers of the ones who have offered sacrifice to these false gods. And he goes and he brings the bones out of these sepulchers and he lays them on the altars and he burns the bones. And the Bible says there that in doing that, he polluted the altars of these false gods so that they wouldn't be able to use them anymore. He was serious, folks. He was serious about it. He didn't care what it cost him, even to the point of taking his own mother off the throne. He says, Mom, you can't be queen anymore. You can't rule this house anymore if you're going to be carnally minded. If you're going to allow those things. I I say this all the time. I'm going to hush here in just a minute. I say this all the time. You look back at this Old Testament when, when, when Israel was wholly given to idolatry, God would let them go for a while. When, when Israel was holy and completely given to God, of course God was pleased and He'd let them go in that as long as they would. But when they begin to mix the things of God and the false together, God's anger would be kindled very quickly. Very quickly. That translates pretty well into what he talked about in Revelation because thou art lukewarm. He said, I, I would that you were cold or hot. I'd rather you love me with everything in you or just deny me altogether than to try to mix the two. He says, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. I will vomit you out. It's a sickening thing to God. I read the other day and I was looking. The word sin means an offense. I mentioned that in Sunday school. <coughs> that word sin means an offense. But then every so often you find where God pronounces an abomination. He said this or that. You know, This is an abomination against me. And that word abomination means something disgusting to God. It's, it's more than an offense. Sin's bad. Abomination is, is disgusting to Him. And for us to be lukewarm, he says, it's disgusting. He said, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. I'm not going to have it. He said, I'll have all or nothing. And that'll be it. That's all he'll accept. That's not all we try to offer. But that's all he'll accept. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. There's two Scriptures. I've told you this before, but there's two Scriptures that help me Every day. Every day. I've had to tell myself these two for a long time, but they've helped me every day. One is this in Romans 8, 28, where I mention it all the time, that all things work together for the good of those that love God. And it goes on and talks about conforming them to the image of His Son. I understand now that God's conforming me to that image, regardless of what I go through. And then the other Scripture where He says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I don't know what our face. The Bible says, don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. i got enough to worry about today, in other words. got no idea what's around the corner, but I know who's already there waiting for me and, and able to, to help me. And I know that whatever it is, he, He's got it there to conform me to His own image. And so I can face it. I can face it. Because I know that. Come on and get us a song here. <clears throat> you know, we need uh, so bad, we need just a, a visitation by God. We, we just need to be in His presence. And it's going to have to become a, a daily thing, but it's going to take training that mind to be spiritual to get it. You know, I wrote down here in my notes that we need a daily deliverance, a daily bringing out of bondage, a daily overcoming. 
And then it hit me as I wrote this. I promise I didn't think about it before I wrote it. Paul said, I die daily. If you want to obtain the daily deliverance and overcoming and deliverance out of bondage, then we have to die daily. We have to train this mind to be spiritual, not carnal. You know, we don't we don't have to walk around with our heads hung down all the time. You see a lot of Christians and they look just as miserable as anybody you've ever seen. We don't have to walk around with our heads hung down all the time. The very first verse that I read to you today said that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. He's telling us there that we've been acquitted of all wrong. You know, we've been found innocent, even though we know we was guilty. We don't have to walk around worried all the time and scared to death. We got God watching over us. Anybody believe that? Go ahead, raise your hand. Anybody believe God's watching over us? All right. All right. Maybe you can come to the altar if you have no strength to raise your hand. So let's all pray a while here. Everybody just pray as long as you need to pray this morning. Don't be in a hurry to come up off these altars.